good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is lesson number one on our study of angels. I want to thank Lance for offering a suggestion for the class. He has an interest in the subject, and we should all have an interest in the subject because it is something that the Bible talks about, and uh, uh, just a lot of interest out in the public about angels. And because of that interest out in the public, we've got to look at the two ways that can be, we can approach this study. And of course, angelology is the study of angels. Uh, but the two approaches, okay, number one is the biblical analysis. It answers the question, what does the Bible teach about angels? and how angels relate to humanity in serving God's purposes, okay? God's purposes, that, that is key. Well, the whole thing is key. What does the Bible teach? But what's God's purposes in how and what the Bible teaches, what angels, who they are and what they do? The second, the second approach is a generic study of literature concerning angels. And that's different than a biblical analysis. It deals with what people teach about angels and how angels relate to serve humanity's purposes through non-biblical literature and anecdotes. Uh, in college, Lance can relate to this, I'm sure. Uh, if you are doing a research paper, uh, the professor will want you to have references in doing that research paper. So the student will read a bunch of material use those references in the research paper, but once the professor reads that research paper, he might come back with some marks on that paper, and especially marks if he used footnotes or endnotes in the paper and saying, this reference is pop science, or this is not a reliable reference source. So we could maybe frame it in this way. If you go down to Walmart and you see a book on the shelf that says Angels and it's by author Reverend blah 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 so and so and so and so. You might think, well, that ought to be an authoritative book on angels. Well, in essence, it's probably just a popular book. It's probably not a well-thought-out, well-designed biblical analysis of the subject. And if you go through it, you might find lots of non-biblical literature and anecdotes about angels, stories that people tell about what they think about angels and experience that they had, experiences they have had, or maybe didn't have, that they uh, assumed was angel experiences. See what I'm saying? And you've got to be able to separate the two if you want to have a good understanding. So what approach are we going to take since this is a Bible class? Well, we're going to do the first approach, which is a biblical analysis. And I think once that we look at a biblical analysis and we compare the two, we would note that there are a lot of non-biblical views of angels today. Think of some of the non-biblical approaches and things that people teach 
uh, about angels. Uh, first of all, some people teach that angels are human beings who have died. And a great example of this is what's called the replacement theory. Replacement theory. And this was postulated uh, many years ago that, well, what happened was God created angels, okay? Satan, being one of those angelic beings, now notice how I use that term, uh, created a rebellion, and I think in their literature they would say about a third of the angels that God had created went with Satan in this rebellion. And therefore, God created human beings in order to replace those angels that had rebelled against him. That that's the reason for human beings in the first place, so that when there are enough human beings to replace those angels that rebelled, that's when Christ will come back and but that's what our purpose would be. But that's kind of the, the essence of the replacement theory. But again, it's just a theory. All right? Uh, a, a second approach is the impersonal sources of power approach. And people believe this. People will teach it. Oh, what are you talking about impersonal sources of power? I've talked about this before. A great example of this is karma. <clears throat> the, the Eastern mysticism uh, belief in karma. It's just a power that's out there that's working, but, but that's what angels, you know, that's a part of an angelic thing. That the angels are there to, to take care of these problems. Well, again, you don't find that in the scriptures. You don't find that in the Bible. Some people do not believe that angels exist at all. And we can go back to the Bible and find that because the Sadducees did not believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. In fact, they didn't believe in spirit beings. They were the secular humanists of their day. How can you not believe in spirit beings but talk about God? They didn't believe about demons either. No, nothing of that sort. So that's you know, when they, when they would say, well, Jesus has a demon, they didn't even believe in demons. Well, what would, the, what would they be talking about? Talking about the same thing today that many people talk about when they say that, that, that people who have some mental problems, well, they've got a demon. They'd use that today, corresponding. And there's a difference between mental problems and demon possession. I've tried to point that out in, in what we talk about the, uh, the abyss and that Satan and the demons for the thousand year church age beginning, I believe about AD 70 are in the abyss and are going to be there until right near the end, okay? They don't have the power today to possess people's bodies. But for some people, you know, they want to impose that uh, that theory and, and give an excuse, you know, and people will fall into it. So a biblical approach and understanding of angels will help correct these false beliefs. That's why a biblical analysis is so important. Because what? Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The scriptures give us everything that we need to know. Everything that we need to know uh, to be right with God. Once we're enlightened as to God's truth about angels, you know what we can do? We can ignore supposition. We can ignore superstition. We can ignore fictional anecdotes, and we can ignore man-made traditions. I took my wife to 
Oh, what's that place called up in Missouri? Branson? No, no. the oh, Angel Place. Precious Moments. Precious oh, yeah. Moments Precious Chapel. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's a whole creation out of the mind of a human being. Okay. Oh, they'll have Bible verses here and there and everything, but it's still something that a man has made up. Fictional anecdotes. Oh, uh, it was a cold winter's night and snow was coming down and our car ran out of gas on the highway and, you know, uh, somebody come along, gave us gas, took us to the, to the gas station, filled up our tanks or whatever and what, you know, but, but then there were no traps of them in the snow and what, you know, it's just like they had to be angels, you know. That's anecdotal evidence. Well, people wouldn't make up stuff like that, would they? Uh, yes, they would. Remember here, just what, two, three years ago, there was a, a, a young boy who had been sick and heart stopped. Doctors maybe even declared him dead, whatever. But they did get him back to life. Well, uh, with his father's help, wrote a book about that he went to heaven and he saw God and all this stuff. Okay. Well, a couple years later, come out and he says none of that was true. His father fed him all of that stuff. Why? There's lots of money making books, isn't it? And if people will buy the books, people want to hear things like that, they'll buy those books, people can make money from it. Superstition, yeah, there's a lot of superstition out in this world, and a lot of it comes from what is supposedly religion. Religion. And supposition. Well, I just suppose that that's what it is. Oh, that's what somebody told me. No. Following God's word, we'll discover, we'll discover things that are true, but we'll discover beings that are so unique that they could only have been created in the mind of God. Then in our mind's eye, which and remember, who's our mind's eye created in? Uh, whose image is our mind's eye created in? It's God's image then we'd be blessed to see the glory of God. Now let me tell you something, okay? What you're going to see is there's only like three creatures. Three that the Bible talks about. Revelation chapter seven, verses 11 through 12. It's just pulling it out, so don't worry about context right now. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders. Who are the elders? I don't know. Are they angels? I don't know, because the Bible doesn't say. And the four living creatures, well, what about the four living creatures? Are they angels? They're angelic beings because the Bible says they are. But they are four living creatures, and we'll deal with that later. And they fell on their faces, the, the elders, before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So they're created beings that are here. Now, the elders may be human beings who have gone on, representing the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. That's, that's just my supposition. That's me throwing something out there for you to consider and I've talked about the martyrs possibly having a special place 
in the heaven. So, but the four living creatures and the angels, what we're dealing with right there. Okay? But Hebrews chapter, that, that's talking about angelic beings. Hebrews 1.14 talks about their purpose. And they, talking about angels, oh, I'm sorry, are they, talk about angels, not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Is the red light on? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. Yep. So, that was introductory material. But if we're going to do a biblical analysis, the first thing we have to do is define the terms, right? How does the Bible use these terms? What does the Bible say about it? So, in definition, the Old and New Testaments use four words to define angelic beings. Four words, okay? For a total of 432 occurrences throughout Old and New Testament, 432 times. So the four words that are used, number one, living creatures. Now this is not the most used, but this is like the, the first occurrence that comes through. Living creatures is used 40 times in the Bible. Some in the old and some in the new. And didn't we just have that in Revelation chapter um, chapter seven? The four living creatures. Now that's in the New Testament. The New Testament is typically in Greek, but but the word there, uh, well, it's, it still comes out living creatures. Okay, but from the Hebrew word. Uh, Kai, that means a living thing or animal. And the four ways animal, life, appetite, revival, renewal. But it's just talking about something that's living, a living creature. And what you have to do is separate that by context. Is it talking about a heavenly living creature or an earthly living creature? That's where you pick up the context. You look at what the, the passage is talking about. And of course, in Revelation chapter 7, okay, you can see it's talking about a heavenly situation there, heavenly context. All right? Second is cherubim. Cherubim. And this is used 96 times in the Bible. And it comes from the Hebrew word keru or keru from kara or we say cherub. Okay? And in in the Greek especially, the CH is a hard, like a K, because there's no K in the uh, uh, the Greek. I'll think of it in a moment, okay? But but the C-H, like Christ, Christian, okay? So it'd be cherub, we say cherub, okay? You think of cherub and you get this picture of a fat little baby angel, right? With a bow and arrow, usually. But uh, that's totally different than the picture that the Bible would give us. So, uh, cherubim is the plural of it. And it's an angelic being. And it's used as guardians of Eden. There were four, or there were cherubim placed at the gate to get out, or especially that Adam and Eve couldn't get back in, uh, as flanking God's throne. That passage in Revelation 7 and other passages that there are four cherubim at the throne. What are they doing? They're guarding the throne. 
Uh, as third, number three, as an image from, as an image form hovering over the Ark of the Covenant. If you've seen uh, pictures, artistic drawings of the Ark of the Covenant, you've got the cherubim over top of the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? And then as the chariot of Jehovah, figuratively. Why the chariot of Jehovah? Well, when we see a passage in the book of Ezekiel, you see that the cherubim are kind of holding up the, the throne of God and moving it. Right. And we'll catch that later. You know, I, I never picture that picture as an angel. I always thought that uh, some kind of an animal that... Cherubim? Yeah. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. But angelic I'm using it as a form of angelic creature in a sense that it is not of this world. It is of heavenly dimension. Okay? The third is a seraphim. Only mentioned twice in the Bible. And it comes from the Hebrew word sodaroth, which means a serpent or a fiery serpent. And in that sense, it would be a poisonous serpent. And fiery from the burning effect of poison. Okay? And I remember the when the children of Israel sinned in the wilderness, or in, in the book of Numbers, and the serpent, the bronze serpent that was put on the pole, <coughs> And the children of Israel had to look at it if they were bitten by a serpent. Okay. Medical symbol today are two serpents on a pole, right? But you know that poison, lots of the medicines that we take today are poisons. The poison in a controlled environment can be a medicine. Yeah, it's like my daughter when she got bit by a rattlesnake. They use rattlesnake, I mean, the poison off the rattlesnake and they inject it into for to counteract the poison that's killed in head. Yeah. Well, another example is alcohol. Alcohol. Okay, so. Cough medicine has a large amount of alcohol in it because it will kill the diseases, you know, the, the germs that it mouthwash has alcohol in it, all right? But if you use too much, what happens? It destroys body parts, it'll destroy the liver, it'll destroy kidneys, and you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So used as a medicine, it's one thing, but you got to be careful, all right? But also, majestic beings with six wings, human hands or voices, and attendance upon God. Now, the difference between seraphim and cherubim, other than these physical differences, I think if you look back, cherubim are guardian creatures, guarding the throne and guarding like the, the Garden of Eden back then, and seraphim are announcing angels. They've got a message and they go announcing things. So would the, the guardian, or the guardian angels there, those cherubim, would those be considered archangels or is that different too? Archangel's different. Okay. Archangel is an angel but think of it in the terms of, you know how you have centurions in the New Testament who are over a thousand men? Think of it in those terms where you have angels that are over a number of other angels. And that would give you an archangel. And we'll see when we talk about Michael how that would come into play. 
So angel is used the most throughout the Bible, but it's typically in, in the Greek as angelos, because in the Koine, there's the word I was looking for earlier, Koine Greek, which the New Testament we have the manuscripts of. When you have two G's together, the first G becomes an N when you pronounce it. So it's angelos, right? Angels. And that is a messenger on, or an envoy, one who is sent, an angel, a messenger from God. Now, listen to that, a messenger from God, and that messenger can be angelic, heavenly or earthly, okay? But it's a what? Messenger, which means it has a message, which means there's communication. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, context. How are words we how are the words we define used in the Bible? How are they used? Okay? So what I'm going to do right now. No, I guess I'm not. I thought I was going to, but just give me a moment. Context, again. The term living creature applies to all spirit beings, angels, cherubim, and seraphim. Living creature applies to all spirit beings beings when we're talking about the created beings. We're not talking about God, Father, Son, Word, Holy Spirit, okay? But angels, cherubim, and seraphim. Are angels a living creature? Yes. Okay? So now we've dropped down from four classifications to three classifications. Amazing, isn't it? And the Bible provides some details for some of the spiritual living creatures, but you know what? It's silent with most. It just doesn't say too much in description. So, Revelation 4, 6-11. And before the throne was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, how many sides does the throne have? Four. We would assume that there's four, right? Because what are four living creatures? <laughs> Full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature, like a lion. Now, catch this, because this sounds a little bit different than what you have in the book of Ezekiel. But I think it's just the way it comes out in, in translation, okay? The four living creatures, full of, uh, I'm sorry, verse 7, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings, are full of eyes all around and within and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns, this is the 24 elders, before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O our Lord and God, to receive honor, a glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Note the description of the cherubim as seen from any one perspective approaching the throne. And what, what I'm trying to point out is we're going to reconcile this with the book of Ezekiel. Okay? You're walking up to the throne. Say you're 
You're walking up to it from this angle, and what are you going to see? On this one, you're going to see the face of a lion. On this one, you're going to see the face of an ox. On this one, you're going to see the face of a man. On this one, you're going to see the face of a lion. Did I get that? Or the, the eagle. Yeah. You're going to see those four faces because they're each looking out at a different way. See what I'm saying? Like if Lance was here and looking this way, and Charlie was there looking that way, and Bobby was back there looking that way, and Karen was back there looking that way, and they each had four faces, what are you going to see? You're going to see the four different faces, and John is telling you what he's seeing. Okay? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay, good. Because I'm trying to reconcile. So cherubim are near God's throne. They have multiple wings, reflect his or God's glory, and follow his commands. Now, Ezekiel 1, 4 through 10. Ezekiel is talking about this, what he sees coming over the desert, right? Because he's in, by the river Kibar. He's in Babylonian captivity. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing from uh, forth continually and in the midst of the fire as it were gleaming metal and from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness. They kind of looked like human beings, right? But each had, each had what? four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. Uh, in, in modern literature, you got to be careful. In modern literature, uh, a foot like a calf's foot denotes the devil. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings and on their four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched each other. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. That would be on the back side, right? Four faces. Is it, that's the same as in Revelation, but different perspective. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not that Ezekiel's seeing one thing and John's seeing something totally different. It's the same thing, it's just different perspective of them. Now, Ezekiel 10, 20 through 22. These were the living creatures that I saw underneath the God of Israel by the Kibar Canal. So they were underneath. And if you go back and you look at it, what it looks like is a throne, back in chapter 1, it's a throne that these cherubim are going under, carrying it, moving it, but they're guardians of it also. And I knew that they were cherubim. Each had four faces and each four wings, and underneath the wings the likeness of human hands, and as for the likeness of their faces, they were the same faces as appearance I had seen by Kibar Canal, each one of them went straight forward. So, if they move this way, they move this way, this way, or this way, they didn't turn. They moved straight. 
So if y'all got a picture in your mind of what they look like, these cherubim, do it look like that? General, but that throws me because it said four, four faces. There's four faces there. The cow on the left, oh. the other one on the other side. I was thinking human face. Yeah. There's a the human. I know it's a little blurry. There's a the human face. Ox. Lion. Eagle. I understand that, but I don't. Human feet. Which it says like calf's feet, yeah. so that's a little bit different. But hands, wings, this is just one artist's representation. I always imagined there was one head with four faces. Yeah. I, I never that's really conceived what? of it as one body with kind of like four heads. In this study that I'm doing to present to you, there are things that I am taking second looks at saying, I didn't see that before. But I'm just trying to show you sometimes we get things in our mind that and then somebody throws something in and says, nothing in it. Maybe I need to take a second look. But you understand? Am I saying this is exactly what they look like? No. Please, no. But you can get on the internet, you can look at them, but this does not look like a fat little baby with a bow and arrow. No. And that's what popular opinion says a cherub would look like. Okay? Now I want to get through a couple, at least a couple more of these. Okay? Seraphim. Again, are fiery serpents have six wings and are also found near God's heavenly throne. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah in the temple. Okay? He's in the most, in the holy place. And I guess the curtains kind of opened up. He sees in the most holy place and the throne of God and all. But here's what he sees. In the year the king of Zion died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The naos, not the heron, the naos. Above him stood the seraphim. Where? Where were they? Above him. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he... What? Flew. Seraphim fly, can fly, okay? The one called to another, because what are they doing? What does Seraphim do? They're announcers, right? and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who calls, like there was an earthquake. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, that's Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts. Where did he see the king? The Lord of hosts? Most holy 